Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the DU Podcast. This is your host, John Gordon, and we're in our final segment, jogging down memory lane of our celebration of 25 years of Ducks Unlimited Television. Joining me today are three former co-hosts that y'all will recognize, at Field Huddle, Ainsley Beeman Kenworthy, and Zach Peterson. Welcome to the DU Podcast, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, man. Man, I, when I put all these uh, the guest list together for this, I, I, I really try to put some people together who had, had worked together a lot. And y'all were host in the same time frame, so I thought it'd be great to put the three of you together. And, and when's the last time y'all saw each other? Been a while. <laughs> yep. Do you think it was a national convention maybe in 2000? Is that 2014? We were in St. Louis together. That's what Had I was been. thinking. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Field, that's that's, when, I've, uh, seen you, I've seen you since then with, with uh, some video work we've done together. But yeah, Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, at the convention, uh, Mr. Bourne was with us as well. I mean, I remember that plain as day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And another guy you worked with quite a bit, Wade Bourne, and we've talked about Wade with, with all the hosts because he was such a thread throughout DUTV for so long. And the, the stories about him have just, you know, flown like a river. Uh, and it just, you know, he's he, he was a special guy. And I, well, I, I wish I had him on the show now. But, uh, you know, that's not the case. But, you know, we really have celebrated Wade's part in DUTV along this whole series. And uh, it's been great. Um, so anyway, I, I said Ainsley Beam at Kenworthy. Ainsley, congratulations. I know you just you got married recently. Thank you so much. Two months today, so. Two months today. Wow. Okay. Yes. <laughs> that's uh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you know, you. I, I thought about this that I've uh, personally have history with all three of y'all. You know, um, field. I, I feel like I met you two thousand seven when I started working at Avery. Uh, oh know, yeah. Were, I think you were. I know I saw you at the office first. You know, down yep. there at the old beautiful office on Cumberland Street, <laughs> and then. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's quite the place, you know. It's and yeah, the location uh, and the there. place. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's I haven't been over there in a minute. I got to go by there and, and bother Alan, I guess, at some point. Absolutely. But, uh, and then uh, I've been working with Zach for years now uh, with uh, DU Films and and DU Conserve, and and we've hunted together and everything else. It's uh, it's been great, Zach. And uh, I hunted with Ainsley once in Beaver Dam, uh, with the show yes. they did there. I was helping the boys out, and it, really, what a, a fantastic episode that turned out to be. So that was uh, really special. So um, I've never hunted with you, Phil. That's, I, I figured I would have along the way somewhere. So I know. I We've seen each other that. at the office so many times, and you know, I wanted to get together just yeah. so I can have some of your cooking. I hear you're quite the chef. <laughs> Well, man, you know, I do what I can. I do what I can. But, uh, you know. Anyway, so I'm going to start out talking about, you know, what led y'all to be host on DUTV. And, you know, the backgrounds, everybody's got a pretty similar background. And But the three of y'all are from different parts of the country. But, you know, a common thread that you're waterfowl hunters and that you, you got into it from a young age. And that's kind of the way DUTV is, right? I mean... You know, Phil, you you grew up in Kentucky, Zach in Kansas, Angel in Louisiana. So you got three different parts of the country, you know, three different types of habitats, types of hunting styles. It's just everything we showcase on DUTV. So I think we, having y'all as hosts really worked out well mm-hmm. because you just you brought that with you to the show. So, uh, Phil, I'm going to start with you. Uh, just, just give us a brief rundown of, of, of how you got involved in waterfowl hunting and – and how you really became involved with DUTV? Well, uh, the the shortest version of it, basically my dad. Um, he started my brother and I at a very young age. Um, in fact, eight years old, uh, he actually, he started us waterfowl hunting before he did, he allowed us to turkey hunt because turkey hunting was too dangerous. You know, people get shot turkey yeah. hunting. But going out on the Ohio River in January when it was blowing 20 mile an hour out of the northwest, I guess, <laughs> wasn't that dangerous in his eyes. But um, exactly. no, I, I got hooked on uh, calling is what kind of drew me to it. Uh, I love waterfowl hunting. I love coyote hunting. I love turkey hunting. If I lived out west, I'd be an elk hunter. 
Um, so through the calling aspect is what I really fell in love with. Got into competition duck and goose calling at a very young age. Uh, worked with a number of call makers and then uh, worked for Zinc Calls for eight years doing call production, call design, video production. And that's how I originally met, probably got, met some of the original guys at Ducks Unlimited. Uh, we did a Canada hunt um, with Jim Alexander and Matt Young. Um, they came and we, you know, they're on our video series. And then um, after my days at Zinc, I was working for Avery, which is where I met you, John. And uh, we were doing some video Correct. projects for um, Ducks Unlimited. And we had a couple meetings there at the office with uh, Mr. Tom Fulgham. And then it was right after that um, I started doing field proven calls full time. And Tom Fulgham uh, called me out of the blue and he said, hey, uh, we need some help with DUTV. Are you interested? And I thought, sure, I'd love to be a cameraman. I was like, you know, I've videoed, held the camera for a number of years. And he goes, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about hosting. And I was literally spe speechless. I was, it was just humbling and such an honor to even be thought of. Um, then I went down there to corporate, the corporate headquarters and met everybody and talked it over. And that was in, oh, uh, what year was that? Uh, yeah, nine years ago. Um, my son, in fact, I remember my son was <laughs> born that same year because I didn't actually, <laughs> my wife understands I've been in this business for a long time, but I was at the hospital. And he was born, and I actually had to leave. I left the hospital because we were doing a shoot in Prince Edward Island, and I, I <laughs> didn't even take my son home. But it was all good, you know. <laughs> my wife understood, and we had family there. But no, it's uh, Ducks Unlimited Television has been a major part of my life. Um, it's a chapter that I'm so grateful for, and I'll never forget it. It's been absolutely amazing. Well, that's uh, yeah, that's great, man. I mean, like I said, it, all of y'all, it, it meant so much to the show over the years. Uh, Zach, question, same question for you. Yeah, I guess, I guess from a waterfowl standpoint, um, just like Field, it was, it was my dad, you know, and I was fortunate to grow up in a family with a grandpa and a dad that, that loved to hunt, and and growing up in eastern Kansas, you know, with with uh, western Missouri just a few miles away, you know, we had amazing duck hunting growing up, so. Um, seems like there's less people hunting the public ground back in those days compared to what it is now. And so we'd, we'd stomp around the public marshes, you know, and, and, uh, just South of Kansas city and, and fell in love with it, you know, at an early age at 10 years old, probably. And, uh, you know, I, I, over the years, I, I just from a hobby standpoint, always loved the idea of videography and photography. And, and, uh, my mom shot some photos growing up and, and I think over the years, probably by, by the time I was 12 or 13, had bought a little, you know, home ha handy cam, handheld type uh, camcorder. And we'd, we'd go goose hunting and duck hunting, turkey hunting and whatever we could find to film. And, uh, and, you know, we'd take me, me and a buddy of mine, you know, we'd take turns be playing host, you know, and, and uh, talking to the camera and then hand it off and somebody else would film and somebody would shoot. And we kind of take turns every day and Christmas break. And, and I always, it was, like I said, just, a, just a hobby and something I always enjoyed, but, as the years went on, I decided it was something, you know, I want to be a bigger part of my life. And I guess it was 2013, got in the video production business. And um, we had a chance to shoot some video down at Honey Break for those guys for Moose Media. And through that, and then going to the SHOT Show the next year, um, you know, met some people, uh, whether it be Ducks Unlimited or just other folks in, in the video production business. And I don't know if I really totally know who brought my name up when when there was a, a host opening, you know, for, for DUTV. Um, but somehow my name got brought up and said, you know, he can maybe help on the video production aspect and then, and then, you know, help in a, a co-host role as well. So yeah, the phone rang one day and, and uh, that was a really cool, humbling experience. Cause just like Teal was saying earlier, grew up watching DUTV with my dad, you know, watching Mark Pierce and, and uh, of course Wade Bourne and looked up to those guys and, you know, the places they went, I'd never duck hunted anywhere other than Kansas and Missouri. So, you know, to see him shoot divers on the coast or hunt, you know, hunting in pea fields in Saskatchewan and all that, you know, it wasn't a thing that I thought I would ever do. It seemed so unattainable, really, and so far away, you know, as a young kid. So, yeah, when the phone rang and I had a chance to uh, audition or apply or whatever you'd call it, you know, for the position and, and got it, that was pretty cool. You know, it was a, a humbling moment and, and really a neat a neat stepping stone for me. And the timing of it was fantastic for my video production business because – I was fresh into it. I was still learning a ton and uh, it was a, it was a neat way to get to travel and meet people and, and uh, really a cool springboard for me to, to launch my business that, uh, that I'm still operating and running today. So it's, 
yeah, a really cool chapter in my life. Feel really grateful to, to hunt from, you know, Northern California to Delaware, Saskatchewan, Texas. I got a chance to go everywhere. So, um, yeah, really, really cool. And, and, uh, a chapter of my life that, uh, yeah, I wish, <laughs> I wish I could do it again, to be honest with you. It sounds pretty good right now. <laughs> Uh, Ainsley, from your standpoint, I mean, you were one of the first female co-hosts of DUTV. And uh, so, I mean, it was, uh, that was, that was a, a great thing. And, you know, it, it really, you brought a, a, just a fresh element to the show. Uh, I, and it, it was your father as well that, that got you into waterfowling, correct? Yes, it was. Um, I, one of the things that I think is so unique about the three of us being on this right now is that we're all telling a similar story from different parts of the country. And I think the underlying theme here is that we're all so humbled to have been given this opportunity because, you know, Zach and Field, you know, they had, you know, probably a little bit more introduction into the industry than me. I had I had done some work in the industry um, at that point, but more from a marketing behind the scenes standpoint. Um, and at the time I was doing some work for Mossy Oak and um, those guys had mentioned to me, you know, that they may be having an opportunity that they thought I'd be a good fit for. Well, I could have never in my wildest dreams <laughs> thought that it would have been DUTV. And um, when they mentioned that to me, my mouth dropped because I can remember being a young girl right out of college, going to the SHOT Show by myself, knowing one person in that entire building and um, sitting across from some of just the pioneers in the industry telling them, you know, my dream was to represent the great outdoors and tell people, you know, what an integral part it had been in my life and how wonderful it can be for young women and mothers and kids and just, you know, what a great hobby and outlet it could be. And um, I can remember some of them kind of laughing at me, basically telling me I'm going to have to pick a side, like you can't, you can't do it all type of thing. And um, little did I know that DUTV would come along and give me that opportunity. And um, so when I look back on it, it really is just kind of this unknown dream come true um, that I got to to partake in that. Um, and just like Zach said, I mean, it's a season of my life that I wish I could relive again. Um, <laughs> it just, it lasted, you know, so long, but I wish it wouldn't have stopped because it was just so great. And I felt like we all made a really good team. Um, even our cameraman, I was thinking about that today and just what an interesting group it was. We all clicked so well. And, um, you know, when Mr. Wade was, was still with us, that was just brought such a, a different dynamic. Um, you know, I, I felt like I was a part of history that I had watched as a child growing up. Um, so it was just really, really humbling. And I still just feel so honored to have been a part of it and to get to represent just any outdoors person, but especially to be a woman on TV giving voice to that. It was something that I'm so proud to have been a part of. Well, like I said, you were a huge part of it, and it, it uh, we really thank you for, for, for all the time you spent with DUTV and, you know, and representing Ducks Unlimited the way you did. It, uh, all three of you, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, you know, a big part of, of DUTV, of course, is the conservation aspect of it. And I know uh, that all three of you have been involved with conservation for a long time. Uh, could just talk about that a little bit, you know, what, what conservation means to you and, and how working with DUTV may have changed your perspective on it. Phil, go ahead. Man, you know, <clears throat> when I was always watching DUTV and I'd see all these different locations and these different – uh, you know, location host people. And it wasn't until, honestly, when I started hosting DUTV, I started noticing a trend from location to location. Um, no matter coast to coast, I don't care if it was California or Maryland, Canada, or Louisiana, everywhere in between also, you've got everywhere, you know, we hunted with the CEO, we hunted with, you know, the president of DU, we hunted with literally the collegiate chapters. And from the collegiate chapters all the way up to Mr. Hall himself and Mr. George Dunklin Jr., they were all equally as passionate about 
conservation, about ducks, about our hunting heritage. And it was the same. It didn't matter, you know, what your, you know, how old you were, or what your financial status was. It's just they were there for the ducks and you wanted to make sure that it was there for future generations. Um, that's what really blew me away. Everywhere you, every person you met, everybody was equally passionate about it. Um, and that was just, that's what I love about Ducks Unlimited. Uh, to me, I think, you know, conservation is, yeah, we can make our mark right now. Um, you can, you know, and you can conserve wetlands, you can enroll, um, land into uh, conservation easements, but it's the future generations. Cause I, I probably 10 years ago, I wouldn't have said that, but now I've got kids. I've got a nine year old and a six year old and I see, I like it breaks my heart to see how much things have changed because I want them to experience what I experienced. And I know that that's not the case because everything's different. Um, but I want to make sure that, you know, when they're my age, they're going to have the same hunting opportunities, the same opportunities to get out there and actually see migrations of ducks and see those flocks of pintails. And just, you know, that's that to me, that's conservation. Conservation is making sure that our kids and the, you know, the future generations are, ready to fill those shoes there's amazing people in place right now doing amazing things but that doesn't mean anything if once they're gone it just stops um so it's always you know looking two three four steps ahead to make sure that there's people to ready to pick up that ball and run with it um or baton or whatever you want to call it but um i guess again the the kids and the younger generation that's why i love seeing these collegiate chapters um when i was actually at western kentucky university um i was there for the, the start of that collegiate chapter. Um, I didn't come up with the idea. There was a guy that came to me, knew I was a duck hunter, and he said, hey, we're thinking of starting a WKU uh, DU chapter. What do you think of helping, you know, get this off the ground? And I was I was blown away at it. We went to the the, the DU events. We had our, you know, our founders uh, shirts, and, and I was actually gone when they actually had their first event. I'd already moved to Ohio and started working, but um, I'm very proud to, you know, kind of help put that in motion there. And now, and that was kind of a rare thing back then. Now the collegiate chapters are actually kicking tail. And now there's even the high school, you know, there's high school involvement. And I think, I think that's, that's conservation in my, you know, humble opinion. You're, you're right, man. And I, and I've really tried to showcase uh, <laughs> the younger generation coming up on DUTV in the last couple of years. I've got a really cool episode coming out here in this 25th anniversary season that in Colorado, uh, with uh, with three guys from the Colorado State chapter, and we and we did kind of a mashup with with Campus Waterfowl. We we've really been involved with that with that uh, show as well. And we just and what where you know Derek Christians who works with Campus Waterfowl, he, he goes around to all these chapters around the country and really in films with the with the different uh, folks who are involved with the DU, and it's it's really been great. Uh, Zach, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think my time as a co-host of DU TV confirmed that I wanted to do what I could to make a difference in the world of conservation. Like, you know, growing up, I guess I understood it. You know, you're around it, but you're a young kid and and um, trying to shoot a limit of ducks every day, right? And then maybe you don't totally understand the big picture and why there's birds there and what we need to do as hunters to make sure they're always there. Um, so it was, for me, it was the education piece to be with biologists and, and local volunteers and uh, regional directors and stuff, and, and just get educated to understand how this all works. And, uh, and, and like Field said, you know, whether how much money you have or how much land you have, you know, there, there's a part that everybody can play in it. And, uh, and so like to date, you know, I, I take a lot of pride in, you know, trying to introduce people to the sport. And so, you know, we'll, donate a hunt at our farm, you know, to a local charity where, you know, we encourage, you know, a couple of groups of father sons by it so they can give them a chance to spend some time together. But then it gives me a chance, you know, talk to high school or college age kids about the, the conservation piece of it and how uh, we all need to do our part to, to make sure there's always birds in the sky. So I think, I think that, I think that was the biggest thing for me is just spending time with, with the es- experts in the field and really understanding um, how the, the world of wetland conservation works and through that education, you know, it made me, I drank the Kool-Aid, I guess you could say. And I'm like, man, this is, this is really cool. And this is something that, that I want to be a part of going forward. And I'm going to kind of craft my own way to, to contribute, um, however I can to, to, uh, to make sure we still, you know, have, have birds in the sky and then have a chance to, uh, you know, it's, it's such an amazing venue, you know, for father, son, or for, 
for a uh, uh, husband, wife, or whatever it may be, friends that get together and go hunt. And I think, you know, it's, that's something I, I hope that's never removed from us, uh, us to have that chance to go out in the morning and, and hunt together. Um, whether you shoot ducks or not, I, I hope, I hope it's always there. And, you know, I, I can guarantee you myself and, and, uh, both my boys that are, I guess right there, they're four and two now, um, they'll be raised that way and they're going to be taught about it and hopefully they can carry things forward. So, uh, so, uh, so yeah, no, it was, it was really cool to get educated on it and, uh, and give me the confidence that, that I needed to, to make sure I wanted to stay hooked and then make a difference in conservation. Yeah, that's uh, very good. And it, we've got such a great staff at DU uh, on the scientific side of things. I mean, with the people we have in place out there in the field have forgotten more about waterfowl than most people, you know, will ever know. And, you know, I've integrated those people on the show and I'm sure you all met some biologists and, uh, the, some of the scientists along the way, and those people are just are real experts in the field, and we're real fortunate to have them. Uh, Ainsley, uh, give us your take on what you learned about conservation through DUTV. Yeah, so um, conservation, I, I think Field and Zach both hit the nail on the head there. For me, it's all about legacy and all about education. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, we were all introduced to waterfowling through our fathers. And um I give so much credit to my dad for taking the time to invest in me and not just take me hunting, but to teach me about conservation and to explain those things to me as a young girl. Um, and, you know, a lot of people hear me talk about my dad when it comes to, to this aspect of my life, but I think it's extremely important to stop and recognize the mothers in this picture who also, you know, allow their children to go and encourage them to go, just like Field was talking about his wife earlier, letting him go and do that hunt right after their son was born. You know, those are people who understand the importance of legacy when it comes to conservation. And for me, you know, I look at my childhood and going into adulthood and just what a wonderful life I lived, and so much of that had to do with the great outdoors. And I realize if there's not a focus on conservation and preserving what we've all experienced, it won't be here in the future. And that's so important to me. Um, I'm not a mom yet, but I hope to be one day. And it, I would just be devastated if my kids couldn't experience the life that I did growing up. So for me, it's Legacy is so important there, um, but also education. Like you said, I I got to spend time um, with a couple of biologists whenever I did the hunt in Montana, and it was just so eye opening to to listen to their knowledge and just their passion behind what they do. Um, honestly, it kind of made me jealous and rethink my career path. <laughs> but um, it, it's incredible. They're just they're so passionate about it, and I love seeing that kind of unifying message across, you know, all of Ducks Unlimited. Um, that's something to me that is just um, a really, really great attribute of the um, organization. Yeah, it, it, it is great. Like you said, we, we've got s such a great staff. You know, you really yeah. have to, to always point back to that, to the folks that really put that work into the ground, that, that make all of it possible, that really keep the waterfowl populations healthy. Uh, both in Canada, here in the U.S. and in Mexico, we've got some incredible people on the ground really doing this work. And they just you just can't thank them enough. Uh, I want to close out this podcast really talking about uh, favorite shows. That's something I've touched on with the, with the other hosts. And and uh, it's everybody seemed to have, you know, one or two that really stood out in their mind for one reason or another. Richie was telling me about uh, they went to Honey Break one time, and I, I saw some footage of this where they put the uh, the airboat into oh, the lake, and it sank right off the bat, and they were trying to go out there deal hunting, and it sank. So uh, I think, Angela, you followed that one up. I, yes. I, figured, I saw that footage. You, you went the next year, and y'all yeah. had a great hunt, but – yeah. They they got off to a rocky start on that one. So, Phil, um, I tell you, an episode you were involved with that, that I really like a lot is the one with Cal Kingsmill. And I think oh, that really man. touched a lot of people over yeah. the years. Uh, Cal talking about his you know his uncle in, in, in World War II and, and how passionate he was about carving and the art of it. 
And so tell us just a little bit about that episode and what it was like. Man, that episode there, um, you know, so that was located right in the heart of New Orleans. Um, and so Cal Kingsmill, he and his, uh, I believe it was his brother, they own and operate a heavy, or a heavy, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to butcher this up, a heavy recovery business. So when semis are in wrecks, they go and recover the wreckage and they're dealing with that. It's not just cars, it's whenever there's heavy trucks involved. So um, Mr. Kingsmill, he's a Vietnam veteran. Um, he does heavy, you know, truck recovery. Um, he literally has lived a life of seeing nothing but just devastation, violence, death, just, you know, a very dark world that he lives in. Um, I mean, the work he does is great. And where he's located right there in the heart of New Orleans, I mean, it's old town New Orleans. Um, and when you're walking around his, uh, his yard, the trucking yard there, there's trucks that are just absolutely not even recognizable. Um, there's still, some of them are still under investigation. There's still, you can still see blood stains, and it's just, you can't imagine the, how horrific some of those wrecks are. Um, and then when you walk into a shop, I mean, they've been in business for I don't know how many years, and it's just that, that old trucking shop. I mean, everything is, you know, just heavy machinery, just grease, and just, you know, you walk in there, and then he's got this little corner tucked back in the back where he creates some of the most beautiful art you can never imagine. Um, and Kingsmill, he's one of the, I loved hunting with him. He is so simple. Like he's just a, he, he knows what he loves. He loves waterfowl. He loves carving the decoys. And he's one of the last old style carvers. And when you look at his decoys in hand, you're like, man, it looks like an old style decoy, but we actually hunted over them. And we're out there, you know, in the in the marsh. There's alligators swimming around everywhere. And his decoys are not – they sell for anywhere from, I think, 500 to $2,000 a piece. And we're hunting over an entire spread of them. And they look so lifelike. The way they ride in the water, they're all unique. They're all different. I'm just – that, you know, when you hold it in hand, it's like, man, that's a cool decoy. But when it's sitting out there on the water, it's as real as it gets. Well, then when those teal would come in <laughs> and I'm coming up to shoot, I'm like, oh, my gosh, do not shoot these decoys. You know, these are not, yeah. you know, what you found on special at, you know, Cabela's or Academy. It's like, I was like, I did not want to shoot a decoy. Um, but we're out there and just Cal, he's a very soft-spoken, um, salt-of-the-earth individual. And one thing I remember sticking out in my mind specifically, we're all sitting around and the hunting got slow. It was hot. And I was talking about how, you know, I used to hunt with uh, Mr. Warren Coco, and he was telling me that the best food in Louisiana, number one, is New Orleans, number two is Baton Rouge, and number three, I can't even remember, because just New Orleans and Baton Rouge were at the top of my mind. And we just started talking about, what would your last meal be? You know, and my last meal, I was like, man, I'm torn between ribeye steak or sushi or, ah, man, it'd be, it's a toss-up. And everybody had these elaborate meals. And we went to Mr. King's meal. I said, Cal, what's your last meal? Oh, man, he goes, a cheese sandwich. I go, excuse me? <laughs> like a grilled cheese? He said, no, 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 just a cheese sandwich, just a good slice of American cheese on white bread. Ooh, I'm in heaven. I'm like, man, that's why I love you. You know, you are just, you know what you like. Um, but, no, that was an amazing experience. And to hear, you know, the letters that um, his, it was his uncle, wasn't it, that wrote to him that's correct. from World War II mm -hmm. talking about yeah. their, you know, couldn't wait to get back um, to duck hunt or to duck hunt, and he ended up getting uh, killed over overseas. And even Cal, you know, when he was in Vietnam, he was down in the the Ming Kong Delta, and he remembers like there's pintails. <laughs> He's like, I'm seeing these ducks that yeah. look like pintails. There's pintails in Vietnam, and he looked it up. He said, Sure enough, I'm seeing pintails in Vietnam. Uh, but no, just an amazing experience. Uh, and it's funny you said that because there was, you know, there was two episodes that I was sitting there trying to think like, which one are my favorite? They're all, they're all awesome. Um, but that one there, I'll probably talk about that experience with people when we bring up, you know, DUTV, I bring up Mr. King's Mill and uh, New Orleans duck hunting more than anything. Yeah, it, it, 
that's another aspect of DUT that's been amazing over the years is all the characters that have been on that show. You know, the the folks we've hunted with, the mm-hmm. folks who you know who are the the folks on the ground supporting Ducks Unlimited and, and Wetlands Conservation, and how incredible those people are and the stories they have to tell. It's it's a great aspect of DUTV that you don't get out of a lot of shows that are just basically about hunting, right? This is this D that that's what makes DUTV different. You know, it's the people. Uh, yeah, Zach, absolutely. anything off the top of your head? The people, yeah, exactly. That you remember just really sticks out. Any? Oh, I mean, probably the thing that I remember the most is how nervous I was the first one. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Incredibly nervous, and I'd been to Honey Break, you know, from with a, holding the camera in my hand, not in front of the camera. I, I believe the season before is the first time we'd been down there, but um, my first one was in September, teal hunting with, with Drew Keith and those guys at Honey Break, and. I, I didn't have a TV background and not a journalist, a writer, you know, didn't, but just a duck hunter and, and getting thrown into the mix of that, you know, at, at a prestigious place like that. And I remember I was incredibly nervous, the, well, the whole time, but especially the first morning, you know, when they ask for a little hunt rundown and two cameras get pointed at you and you get, you get six or eight people standing behind them watching you. And you've got to explain what happened. I think we only shot a couple of teal the first morning. I'm like, whoo, how do I spin this to not say the teal hunt sucks? Yeah. <laughs> you know? like, uh, uh, so, no, I remember that. Um, and I guess each episode I got a little more confidence each time. But, I mean, they're, it's cliche, but they're all great. Like, it was all places that I'd never been that I maybe would have never gone. So, like, hunted with uh, Al Motna at his place in, in Northern California that was so amazing to – to see, you know, their extremely successful farming operation and then how they fl- flood the rice and all the ducks that show up and just everything going on in the Central Valley there was was really, really cool. Um, uh, DUTV gave me the, the chance to hunt Saskatchewan for the first time. And we had, I, I went, but both, both years I, I went to Saskatchewan, we had incredible hunts. I think like every day, both, both years we went there, just hit it, hit it right. And, uh, I don't know the, the, the whole experience, you know, all the places, like I said, the, the uniqueness, you know, we hunted, hunted out of layout, but layout boats on Lake Erie shooting divers with, uh, with Pat Kehoe. And that, that was a blast and just something I'd only seen in the magazine or on TV before. So I think it was just the, uh, the mix of all the different styles of hunts and different geographic areas that I got to go. Um, you know, that will de- definitely won't ever forget. Yeah. It's, all the places, different places you go, and like I said, Canada especially is a special deal, you know. And it's oh, been yeah. it's been tough the last couple of years, haven't really been able to get into Canada. Although we, <laughs> uh, Doug Larson hosted a show that's going to be coming out this summer uh, at Leopard and Peace River, Alberta, with uh, uh, one of the former uh, DU Canada presidents, and that that was a challenge, man. <laughs> getting back into Canada with uh, all yeah. the testing and everything going on, man, it was just like it was kind of hairy. What if somebody gets stuck up there, you know, for ten <laughs> days or whatever? So I'm glad that that's finally loosened up on that deal. Um, Ainsley, you know, I'd mentioned that uh, beaver dam hunt earlier, and that that was a really cool experience for me to be a part of uh, with you and Carrie and Christine, uh, and uh, oh, I was kind of Jan. Uh, Jan, Jan, that's right. There yeah. you go. Thanks. Uh, she, her name was escaping me, but uh, <laughs> you know that was a really special deal. I mean, y'all got to to uh, to hunt with some of uh, Mike and Lamar's you know, vintage doubles and all that. Uh, Mm-hmm. Just uh, tell us a little more about that from your perspective of, of what that experience was like. Yeah, um, well, it was just so amazing to get to be a part of the history that's there at Beaver Dam. Um, but I think for me, the highlight of that was just the women that I was hunting with. They were all so accomplished and so passionate about the outdoors. Um, it was just a really unique opportunity for me to get to be side by side with them. Um, Christine, you know, she killed her first duck on that hunt. Um, And this is someone who, you know, teaches outdoor education to people um, all across the country. And, you know, Carrie is this, you know, world renowned soccer star and Jan is super involved with DU and just their conservation efforts. So to get to be a part of that there with all the history from Beaver Dam was just really great. Um, But kind of, you know, what the guys have said, too, it's hard to pick just one because, yes, that was a great, phenomenal hunt. And I love being with those girls. Um, You know, I I got to do some hunts with the guys of Mossy Oak and Mr. Bill and Mr. Toxie and his boys. And, 
you know, that was great learning about, you know, that business and how they got to where they are today. Um, and then hunting at honey break, I spent a ton of time there and that was kind of like hunting in my backyard. Um, I love those guys and it, it was, they reminded me so much of my friends that I grew up with. It was just always easy and comfortable being there. Um, and then I had the opportunity to go to Montana um, and actually be a part of the um, banding program out there. And that was incredible. Montana changed my life. I tell everyone if I could move anywhere today, it would be Montana and I would never look back. Um, but um, Abby, the biologist out there, she and I just really hit it off and um it was just a really great, great experience. Um, I'm trying to think where else I went. There were just so many. But, you know, I will say this, and I mentioned it earlier. Um, I think I could have had the worst duck hunt, you know, that there ever was. And it still would have been the most phenomenal time with DUTV because my cameramen were just like next level amazing and we just clicked so well that every hunt was so much fun. Um, and I, I kind of, you know, touched on that earlier that I thought we had such an interesting, unique group of hosts because we all just seemed to work so well together. Um, but I give a lot of that credit to the cameramen. Um, I always say if I could flip the script and I would do a show that was solely focused on the hard work of the cameramen because they are definitely the unsung heroes of um, any TV show, but specifically a waterfowl TV show because there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. Uh, that's a great point. And, and we do work with some incredible videographers and editors. Uh, like I said, uh, yeah. I did the podcast with Guy Shepard and, right. and Richie Davenport. Uh, but there's other guys, you know, Austin Brown was amazing. Yes. Uh, uh, Ed Wall I've worked with as well recently, and it, it goes on and on. Uh, it, uh, what, filming waterfowl hunting is, is extremely difficult, and mm -hmm. people just don't really get an idea of it because all they see is the end result. They don't right. really see the time and effort it takes to get those, you know, those birds in the right position mm -hmm. and, and and everything else that goes into it and all the luck that's involved Even even have, you know, a good hunt. Uh, with a yes. TV camera on, because it's always just seems like you want you want to guarantee a, a slow morning, you know, turn a camera on. So uh, it's uh, so the fact that we've gotten such great footage over the years has has really been incredible. I just uh, want to you know retouch it, like on what Ainsley know. was saying. It's it's the the behind the scenes stuff with the camera guys was where a lot of the laughs happened. You know, because you're still having to yeah. travel to the airport, you're trying to get your luggage, you're trying to find the rental car, you're trying to cram everything in the rental car, you still got hours of driving, you know, people are tired. And that's when, that's when the, you know, you know, you have a great team because everybody's yeah. tired and everybody, you know, you're just trying to help each other out. And you, you know, Ainsley's mentioned a couple of times, uh, you know, the camera crew truly don't get the credit that they deserve because they're the ones that can make or break the trip just with their attitudes and with their, um, they're just, our team was so great to work with. And I still stay in touch with, you know, Austin Brown and Guy Shepard and, yeah. uh, Richie Evans, you know, I need to catch back up with him, but just an awesome, awesome team for sure. And that's, yeah. <laughs> you could do a podcast on some of the stories of the behind the scenes. That's where, that's, where I don't know if I the want real... them telling all those stories. Still. <laughs> Yeah, you know, guys uh, and Richie were a little reluctant to tell everything, you know, the, <laughs> telling tales yeah. on anybody, but they were fantastic when I had So, yeah. hey, I just want to reiterate on the Richie Davenport legend with the boats. That went on for several <laughs> yeah. episodes. He was a curse because <laughs> yes, we were in right. Kansas. <laughs> so he sunk one boat. And then, no, that's right. So there was the airboat that he was in that <laughs> yep. um, it got sunk there. there. Yeah. And then the boat that sunk in Utah. When he was out in it and went down. And oh, then right. we were in Kansas and he was in a boat and they spun a prop or something and that broke boat that boat broke down. So yeah. the boat <laughs> and Richie Davenport actually refused to get in a boat with him. And I'm not even superstitious. <laughs> <laughs> but the, where, the curse was, the curse was you, very real. <laughs> were one of you on the trip where they were at the D U convention, I think? Not the national convention and a pipe busted and it like totally flooded where they were having the convention it was horrible i wasn't there but i heard about it It was really bad i, I wasn't there for that one no yeah. uh, well Rich, Richie talked Richie about involved, it though. Uh, you okay know, <laughs> and, and i tell you who was there wade Bourne was and, oh yes uh, yes and and from what richie told me he said richie 
uh, came walking in the door, and, and Wade looked straight at him with the guys he was talking to and said, it's all his fault. Because <laughs> he's got a curse on his back. It's like you said, every time Richie shows up somewhere, something happens. Yeah. So uh, it, uh, but you know, he said Wade was great, man. <laughs> just laughing about that. That it's it's the curse of, of Richie Davenport. Of Richie, and uh, <laughs> you know, which and, and Richie doesn't get out into the field a whole lot anymore. And shoot, he's he's really tied up at, at the uh, at Mossy Oak mm-hmm. uh, with some of the other shows. But he every now and then he does. Uh, he was on the we did a we did an episode of this year again with. Uh, uh, with uh, Warren Coco, uh, Freddie hosted that episode. And, nice. Uh, Richie was there because a uh, guy couldn't couldn't be there, and so he got to go down there to Louisiana. And another another great episode coming out this year on the on the twenty fifth anniversary season. Uh, well, guys, this has been fantastic, man. You know, just the trip down memory lane. You know, it's uh, you know we could probably sit here for hours talking about <laughs> different experiences on the show, and and how fantastic it's been. Um, but uh, you just you, you can't talk about everything. So anyway, uh, I tell you one thing I really want to do uh, is 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 thank the sponsors of DUTV. That's something I haven't done yet. And you know, all the sponsors over the years for the twenty five years that made it possible. Uh, and you know the current sponsors of Browning Arms and Ammo, Higdon Decoys, Tetra Hearing, all the great folks at Mossy Oak, and of course the title sponsor Drake Waterfowl. I mean, they really make it happen, and they and all of these folks are partners with us in conservation, and so you know it, it just can't be overstated what they mean to to the show production because they 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 provide the funding that makes it all happen. So uh, thanks again to all the sponsors over the years. We've had a had a lot of them, and uh, they've all been you know great partners partners in conservation, and have really made it all happen. So anyway, uh, thank y'all once again for being here. Thank you. Thank you for yeah, having us. It, it was fantastic, man. It was it was great. Great to see y'all on uh, on the little cameras here. <laughs> By the way, I've seen Zach quite a bit. I haven't seen Field or, or Ainsley in quite a while. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, once again, folks, thanks for listening to the DU podcast, and uh, thanks for supporting wetlands conservation. <laughs>